We're reading uh, the book of Philemon. Uh, This is part of a sermon series called uh, One Chapter Wonders. We're basically looking at the three shortest books in the Bible. Uh, This week we're looking at uh, the letter to Philemon. Uh, So let me read it for us. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, Although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favour you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. What evidence is there for the truth of the message of the Bible, the good news about Jesus? What evidence is there for the Christian faith? Uh, Perhaps uh, that's a question that you've wondered if you're here and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. Perhaps if you are a Christian here, you've thought about this and you might point to the fine-tuning of the universe and the intricacy of God's creation or, or perhaps the historical reliability of the Gospels. I wonder if you'd ever thought to turn to the book of Philemon as evidence for the truth, the power of the Christian message. Because here is a letter that shows something of the transforming power of the good news about Jesus. In this letter, it's something which turns the world upside down. 
It's a message that transforms lives, it transforms individuals, it transforms communities, and it transforms societies. That is the power of the good news of Jesus. And here in this book, we see it worked out in the relationship between two people. Philemon and his runaway slave, Onesimus. Let's step back and just uh, look at the context of this book. Um, Paul is the early church leader, a missionary who has planted multiple churches around the Mediterranean, but he is now in prison. And he is writing to his friend, Philemon. Uh, we see in these uh, first few verses of the book, um, he's with uh, Timothy, and he's writing to Philemon, his dear friend and fellow worker. There is a, a familial warmth. He, he loves Philemon, and he is writing to him. And he's writing to Aphia, our sister Archippus, our fellow soldier. We don't know the exact relationship here. It's possible that Aphia was Philemon's daughter and Archippus' son-in-law, or possibly Aphia was his wife and Archippus their son. Or We're not quite sure, but there's a family here that Paul knows and loves. And it's obviously a family that is well-to-do. They're a family of means because the church meets in their home. The church, the home is big enough to host this church community. And the other thing that points uh, to their wealth is the fact that Philemon has owned a slave. We'll come back to that. Uh, but there is something of that warmth of a family relationship here as Paul writes from prison. Uh, we see that at the end as well, verses 22 to the end. Paul asks, prepare a guest room for me. I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. He, he knows that Philemon will be praying for him. He's confident of this. And then he sends greetings. Epaphras, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers, all send you greetings. There is a community here. The message is coming from Paul in prison to a, uh, from a community that know each other, that love each other, that care for each other. A community that is born from the good news of Jesus. It is as a prisoner of Christ Jesus that Paul writes. It is to Philemon his fellow worker and Archippus, his fellow soldier, and Aphia, his sister. Terms showing the closeness of the family that now, as believers in the Lord Jesus, these people have. And Paul is writing to Philemon about his runaway slave, Onesimus. We don't know exactly what's happened. Onesimus uh, probably run away stealing stuff from Philemon in order to pay his own way. And somehow he has encountered Paul. And two things have happened. Firstly, Paul has realized that this is the runaway slave of a friend, Philemon. And secondly, Onesimus has come to trust in Jesus. And so what Paul has got on his hands here is, if you like, a, um, he's got two Christian brothers who need reconciliation. But more than that, he's got a slave and a master who are suddenly find themselves as Christian family. Now, it's worth knowing about uh, the first century context. In that society, slaves had no rights. They were not citizens, and they could be treated exactly as their master determined. Onesimus had run away, had stolen from Philemon, and Philemon is perfectly within his rights as a Roman citizen to have Onesimus crucified. That is the kind of power relationship, if you like, that was the norm within that society. The master having total power over the slave, even to have them killed in the most gruesome way imaginable. And so the stakes for Onesimus cannot be higher. What 
is Philemon going to do? How is Paul going to persuade him? And it's how Paul asks Philemon that is one of the things that shows us the power of the good news of Jesus. So let's look through um, the rest of this letter, starting at verse 4. Paul writes, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. We first see the transforming power of the good news of Jesus in the life of Philemon. Philemon here, Paul says, I've heard about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Later on, Paul um, says uh, to him, you owe me your very self, implying that actually Paul was instrumental in Philemon coming to faith. But clearly he's moved away and has heard of how Philemon has progressed in his faith in the Lord Jesus. He says, I've heard of your love for all of God's holy people. That is, I've seen how your faith in Jesus has transformed the way you see other people. Your faith in Jesus, Paul says, has transformed your love for other people. You now love them. You are part of God's family, and so you love each other. How does that work? Well, when Philemon came to faith, trusting in the Lord Jesus, he was saying, Jesus, I know that I have rebelled against God. I know that I have done wrong, that in your sight I am sinful. I have rejected you. But I'm turning away and I am trusting in you. Jesus, would your righteousness be mine? Would your death be in my place? Please, Jesus, take my place so that I might be brought into your family. That's how Philemon came to know the Lord Jesus, as one who recognised that before God he was sinful and he needed God's forgiveness, and that it only came through Jesus. But because of that, Philemon would have realised that he is no better than anybody else. He too is a sinner in need of a saviour. And so the relationship he would have had, even as this kind of wealthy, influential person within the community who's got this large house and this large family, the status he would have had is the same as any other believer. Equal, because everyone is in Christ. There is no status, no hierarchy within this church. And so, Paul says, I've heard about your love for his holy people. Your love has given me joy and encouragement because you have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. You have not used your status in the community to lord it over them. You have been kind, you have been generous. And so Paul prays that his partnership with us in the faith would be effective in deepening his understanding of every good thing that we share. That sense of sharing, what they have in common, because as believers, they all share in the riches of Christ. And that makes them equal. So then Paul goes on, verse 8. This is how Paul seeks to persuade Philemon. He says, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. This equality, um, Paul could use his status to order Philemon. But as a Christian believer, he realises, no, that kind of power imbalance, that's the way of the world. That's the way of slavery, in fact. That's the kind of relationship out there in the society. No, I'm going to persuade on the basis of love. 
It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you. Most letters in the New Testament, Paul starts, Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of God, or something like that. In other words, you need to listen to me because I've been sent from God as his messenger, as one who has met the risen Lord Jesus, to teach you, to start these churches. But here Paul says, I'm an old man and a prisoner. He's making the point that he's not up here with Philemon down here. He is lowering himself. He's not using his status, his authority to command He is coming alongside in love because that is what families do. And then having lowered himself down, Paul then raises Onesimus up. I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, my son, a slave, son to the Apostle Paul. Shocking to that society, but Paul says, my son, who became my son while I was in chains, formerly he was useless to you. If you've, um, most of your Bibles will probably have a footnote saying that Onesimus just means useful. It's the kind of name that you give to a slave. It is not a nice name. And Paul's playing with that idea. He says, formerly he, was, he wasn't even useful. He was useless to you, but now he has become useful. And the word there he uses isn't the same as Onesimus. It's another word. It's not an insult to a slave. It is a compliment to a family member. It is a lovely word for useful. He's become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. Verse 16, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's raising Anasimus up showing that in Christ they are equal. So he says, I appeal to you on the basis of love. I do not want to do anything without your consent, verse 14. I wanted any favour you do to to be voluntary. I'm not going to boss you around to command you. I am going to persuade you on the basis of love, on the basis of your equality as fellow believers. And just as as an aside, um, that is something of God's pattern of working change in our lives from the inside out, showing us the truth, the reality, the goodness of God's ways, and then convicting us from the inside out to live in the light of it. God's commands are not burdensome because he changes our hearts to want to follow them. That is how God works and that is how Paul is approaching things in this letter. If you're not a Christian, perhaps what you're afraid of is coming, to, coming into a church, coming into a community of people who are just going to tell you what to do, to boss you around, to have authority over you, to tell you the way you can live your life. Well, there is moral uh, teaching in the Bible. There is a right way to live, but the way God convinces us of that is from the inside out which might sound scary, but but think about this. Have you ever done something that you regret? Have you ever done something that you know that you kind of wanted to do it because you did it, but actually you really didn't want to do it and you see how it has led to brokenness and pain and shame? The good news of Jesus says that we are transformed from the inside out to want to do what is right, what is good, what is beautiful, what is true. God's way is the best way, and we're not just told to do it and get on with it, we are transformed and enabled to do it from the inside out. Next we have Paul's actual appeal. 
verse 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Paul, having shown the way that the message of Jesus makes us equal in the Christian community, makes us equal before God, because we are all in Christ, now shows something of the Christ-like love that we have been offered in speaking to Philemon. Christ came to take our place, to take on our debts, to take on our sin. He paid the penalty that we owe in order that we don't have to. And Paul, following his master, says the same. In order to reconcile Philemon and Onesimus, Paul says, I will pay Onesimus's debt. That is how seriously Paul takes the reconciliation of these two Christian brothers. A uh, friend of mine uh, preached this passage recently, and, and he put it like this. He said, it's as if Paul has got one arm round Philemon here. And he says, Philemon, you are my brother. And he puts his other arm round Onesimus, and still looking at Philemon says, and this is my brother too. Would you be reconciled? And then my friend said, Christian love is cross-shaped. Where do you think Paul learned that from? He is following the example of Jesus. Reconciliation is worth what he gives, the, the, whether it's money or status. Paul is saying, I will pay back what Onesimus owes you in order that you might be reconciled. That's how seriously I'm taking this. And his love looks like that of the Lord Jesus. Verse um, 20, I wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Paul knows that Philemon's faith in Jesus has led to his love for God's people and has led to him refreshing their hearts, whether that's um, spiritual teaching or a material provision. We're not sure exactly what it, it means for Philemon to have done that, that, but then Paul says, refresh my heart. How? By showing that same love to Onesimus. That will refresh my heart when I see reconciliation of that kind worked out in your lives. But here's the amazing thing. Verse 21. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. I don't think this is Paul trying to guilt trip Philemon, the kind of uh, thing I've often received emails asking me to do something with thanks in advance or even TIA down the bottom as an abbreviation, kind of guilting you into doing it because they've already thanked you for it, so you've kind of got to do it, but you're doing it begrudgingly. Have you ever had an experience like that? I don't think that's what Paul is doing here. No, he is being literal. He is confident that Philemon will do this because such is the power of the gospel. Not only that he will do it, but do even more than he asks. It's a beautiful picture, as you imagine Onesimus returning to his master, being welcomed not as a slave, but as a son or a brother, brought into the Christian community loved and cared for, welcomed with open arms, just like God does to us. And so what does this letter mean for us? I think it means 
there's, if you like, one big thing, but a, a number of things. Firstly, do we value reconciliation the same way that Paul does? Where we have fallen out with a Christian brother or sister, do we value reconciliation? Our church is to be a place where that kind of reconciliation is seen and is noticed and is a message to the world of the transforming power of the good news. Secondly, how, how do we go about um, getting people to change? Now, as, um, uh, as an eldership, uh, it is uh, part of our job to, uh, to shepherd and to feed God's people here through God's word. But if we are coming across and putting ourselves on a pedestal, I understand that I am standing on a stage, but that's just so people at the back can see me. It's nothing to do with status. Um, if we're putting ourselves on a pedestal and saying, do this, do that, because I say so, that is wrong. The only authority we have is the authority of the word of God. And if we're not preaching the word of God, then don't listen to us. Coercion, however well-intentioned, is not Christian. And Paul knows that. But finally, think about how shocking this book would have been in its context. A society where the least, the weak, are preyed on, where there is no equality, where slaves can just be executed on a whim. In fact, um, if one slave in a household rebelled, often all of the slaves would be executed just to be an example to others. How did we get from that kind of society to a society today where, um, as the author of this book, Glenn Scrivener, um, writes, our society believes in the equal moral status of every member of the human family, regardless of what you think about whether we should have a British Human Rights Act or the European one or whatever. The fact is, we, as a society, we believe in equality. Where did that come from? This book, um, The Air We Breathe, um, subtitles, how we all came to believe in freedom, kindness, progress, and equality. And the contention of this book, and I, I agree with the author, is that it is the Christian message that transformed societies over centuries where those things just became part of the air we breathe, to use the title of the book. Why is it that we care about equality today? Well, Paul couldn't have known it. Paul didn't have some kind of picture for the eventual abolition of slavery in the Roman Empire or the way that Christian believers were at the forefront of the abolition of slavery in the 19th century or any of these things. But it is the transforming power of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that is, if you like, the air that we breathe now. And the church, in a society where, where that we say that we want it, the church should be the place where we see it most lived out. The place where we see that, that bringing together of, if you like, the, the most powerful in society and the weakest as equals. The place where whoever you are whatever you have done, wherever you have come from, whatever you has been done to you, where you can find brothers and sisters in Christ who will not lord it over each other, but who will love and give up their rights in order to serve. That is the community the church is called to as we follow our master, the Lord Jesus. And that is the kind of community whose effects spill out into the world and show the truth of the Christian message, the gospel that transforms lives, hearts, communities, even societies.